Fans live coverage of America's Cup 92. Day three, the tie will be broken, is being brought to you by Diet Pepsi. With 100%, uh-huh. You got the right one, baby. Uh-huh. Our ESPN sailing team welcomes you back on board ITA 25, trailing by 64 seconds around mark number four. You can see both boats with the wind coming over the port side on port tack right now, headed down to mark number five, the right-hand turn. Let's join Gary Jobson. Well, Jim, out here on the fifth leg here, I'm standing with Tom Witt, and Tom, what were your impressions after the start? I mean, why in the world did Taylor not initiate an attacking duel? Well, Gary, usually what you look for is uh, the first thing, look at the other boat and see if you're ahead or behind. Generally, if you're behind, you don't attack right away. Dave Dellenbaugh on America 3 looked over, saw they were ahead of the red boat, tacked right away, and I think what happened is that as the beat ensued, the wind went left a little bit. So KR being behind, got a little further behind as the wind went left. Now you're a sailmaker, and uh, Il Moro here has three new sails for this race. Can they make up this kind of speed difference with sails alone? I don't think so, Gary. I think what you're going to have to see today is a breakdown or some huge error on America 3 to close up this race. You notice Paul uh, worked on his downwind speed a little bit today and actually gained on the first run. But that's a tall order to uh, catch up to America Cube today. She's a fast boat. I have to ask you, since you're out here watching an America's Cup final since the first time since 1980, you've been on all of them. What's it like for you? What's your emotions watching this race? Well, Gary, I, I got to tell you, it's fun to be with you, but boy, I miss it. Um, one thing, seeing America Cube go so fast here against the Challenger makes us feel uh, a little better about our Stars and Stripes performance. And probably means that our team was pretty competitive after all. Based on what you see here, do you think that uh, Il Moro has a chance to win this regatta? I still think so. I think that uh, good sailing ability has a lot to do with these races. You'll see that this race was out of touch in the first uh, five, seven minutes. So uh, I think if Paul has a similar break in a later race, he'll be right there out ahead again. Of course, you remember back in 1983, the score was 3-1, to one, uh, Australia 2 up against you guys, and they were able to come back, too. Yeah, I think what happened there, Gary, is that the fast boat usually prevails if everybody's sailing pretty equally. I think uh, Australia 2 was very fast that year, but I don't think they were really sure, sure of themselves. I don't think they had a lot of self-confidence early on the regatta. As the regatta went on, they found that they were fast. They felt a lot better about their performance and prevailed. Okay, well, we'll go back and watch this uh, change here going around the fifth bar. One of the on-the-water judging boats ducking in there behind America Q. Mark number five, the delta was 64 seconds around Mark four. You see, once again, Bill will come into this mark wide, giving it a good distance, and then cut tight around it for his exit. And this turn here, very critical to how quickly the new sail fills. Helmsman has a lot to do with this maneuver. Like John got a little wet there on the reaching leg. Sewer men have a tendency to do that. He's kind of the end, Ed Norton of sailing. or the Jenniker, and we start our citizen watch. 104, the time around Mark 4. Looks like it's going to be a lot closer than that, doesn't it, Jim? No question that El Moro has gained on that second reach. The close reach. out on that close reach the red boat trailing the white boat by 56 seconds thanks to Tom Wooden for joining us today 
Wally Henry there working away. His teammates leading by 56 seconds as we head to leg six in the button hook turn. Official host businesses who displayed this sign, we thank you. Your support, fair pricing, and hospitality made the America's Cup event possible. There's a storm brewing on the ES. To the Pacific, it's been a wire-to-wire -wire lead so far for USA 23, America Cute. Making a pretty good prognosticator out of Elmoro Di Venezia's strategist, Tommaso Chieffi, who said whoever wins the start looks like they will win the race. Kayard and crew, when they won on Sunday, a wire-to-wire -wire victory by only three seconds. Likewise, USA 23 in race one on Saturday. 56 seconds, the delta around mark number five. Italy gaining on two of the first five legs. Six seconds on the run with the Spinnakers out on leg two and eight seconds faster on the close reach, leg number five. But certainly not making much of a dent in the White Boat's lead. More like the Kiwi boat with all the crew members hiking out, leaning their legs over the side, well in the back part of the boat. That's what the Kiwis were known for. Keeping the weight in the back, the bow out of the water on these reefs. Our 3D sail track, Trimble Navigation, Silicon Graphics, again computers sending signals, GPS off the boats. About halfway down leg number six. Gary, to your eye, the red boat catching up at all? Well, I don't think so, Jim. I think the spatial that America Cube flies on these broad reaches seems to give her a little extra boost of speed. And I wouldn't be surprised if we saw the Italians use a sail like that in the future. America Cube doing a really nice job here. Andreas Josenhan there working the main, actually getting a little chuckle. He and Mike Topa having a dialogue. Right now on America 2's or America Cube getting ready for the uh, sail change, only about two minutes to the next mark. This mark rounding is a button hook turn, a hairpin turn, if you will, similar to Le Mans in auto racing. Pretty challenging to the crew, first time it's been used in America's Cup competition. This Jim, you have to come in there with the wind coming over the right side of the boat, drop the Jenniker sail, put up the jib, jive the boat around, and then head back upwind. How many times do you think they've practiced that maneuver in a year and a half the American Cube team has been sailing in San Diego? Well, okay. I was going to say, Jim, uh, America Cube is just far ahead, enough ahead here that they could come around the mark and pack and be in a lured position to really cause a lot of trouble to Morrow. A tactic that we saw Tom Witt and Dennis Connor use a number of times very successfully against America Cube. And the whole idea would be make El Morrow sail extra distance and get off course. light wind from the blimp but down here on the water it's a lot choppier and uh, pretty strong breeze of about 11 knots you know most boats don't have holes in their hull but right in this area here you can see a hole in the bow of america cube and they have a rope projecting up to the spinnaker pole coming out of that hole and that helps to hold the spinnaker pole down it's known as the four guy that rope to the sailors uh, the Kiwis have their bowsprit. American Cube has their pole down at the waterline level. Josh, how do you want this turn? Count a three. Big spectator fleet today, Gary. We estimate about 400 boats out here. Not quite as big as the weekend, but still a hefty crowd. The boats get a little heftier, too, don't they, Gary, as uh, you get to the cup finals? Uh, I'm talking size, weight, and bank book. All the way around, Jim, and there's a lot of people on these boats, including a giant ocean liner that's out here with, looks like about 1,200 people watching on board. I'd say if you took all the spectators together, you could probably fill RFK Stadium today. USA 23, that's the 17th man aboard the Cuban boat. So we have no idea who it is. 
is because their crew list said they didn't carry a 17th person today. USA 23 got to the left side. 47 seconds in front of the top mark, stretching out to 104, the biggest lead in the America's Cup so far by either boat. Then Kayart dipped down, knocked off another few seconds, and it's 52 seconds around mark number six. Seven, we go back to Windward for the third time, and so far, Gary Jobson, no tacking duel. Surprised? I am a little bit surprised because I thought Paul Kayard was actually doing fairly well in a tacking duel on the last leg. Perhaps he's using this uh, leg to do a little speed testing for the future. He is sailing with heavier sails, anticipating a stronger wind. How much wind do you have out there now, Gary? It looks like American Cube may have a smaller Genoa sail up, too. Oh, they do, Peter. It's blowing a good 12 to 13 knots now. Coming on pretty strong, and the seas are lumpier as a result. Gary's speed testing for the future. If he doesn't win tomorrow, his future is getting shorter and shorter. It does. It means that Kayard has to win three out of four races if he's unable to win here, and that's a pretty tough thing to do. Two out of the next four would be the job for America Cube. But then again, kr has been down before and come back. It's no different here. Hey, kr has got a pretty strong coaching staff, and they'll be able to point out the problems after the start. Peter Gilmore's over there, John Colius, Dave Perry, Steve Barrison. Those guys will figure out what to do. I don't think it'll take too many rocket scientists because this race was determined pretty much in the pre-start, eh, Peter? Absolutely, Tim. It was that choice that Kayard made of his own volition to get to the right side of the course off the line, and he paid for it, and he's still paying for it. As the boats continue up wind now, the wind shifting to the right. That means that America Cube will be sailing a shorter course to the mark, gaining a little bit more. Tommaso Chieffi, 31 years of age, short sleeve shirts just below and to the right of Paul Kayard there, the strategist. Enrico Chieffi, his brother, two years younger, is the tactician, white hat with a vest. Two most famous sailors in Italy until the Silmoro mania came into effect. Well, David Tizano, one of the grinders you just saw in action there, he's pretty famous, won an Olympic gold medal in Seoul. That's right, he was on, what, the eight-man rowing team. Peter Eisler's wife, JJ, headed to Barcelona, representing the U.S. Olympic sailing team and the women's 470, along with Pam Ealing. In fact, they talked to Tommaso and Enrico because they are also world champions in the 470 class. The Chieffi brothers. 17th man on board, El Moro Di Venezia, of course, is syndicate head Raul Gardini. We talked about some of the money, their budget, reportedly whatever it takes. Mr. Gardini has said, if it's spent, there's little to talk about. Our expenses have had a return in industrial investments and discoveries. The cost is less than zero. Had a chance to sit down with Mr. Gardini. Tell me what you think about Michael Fay as a competitor. Dangerous. 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 
He's persistent and creative. Bill Coke, his greatest strength. He spent his money very well. What do you think his biggest weakness might be? Himself. Because? No, but he... He should leave the management to the professionals. If I were Bill, I would stay off the team. He puts up the money, he steers the boat, he runs the compound. He can't do all these things at the same time. It's too much, even for Bill. There is an Italian expression, the old fox, and you've applied it to Dennis Conner. How come? He's an artist, and he's really like a fox. When it's time to appear, he appears. When it's time to hide, he hides. So, at the end, he always gets the chicken. <laughs> what do you think Dennis's biggest weakness would be? Well, I don't know. Sometimes he does not sail very well when he is not concentrating. Sometimes he waits until it's his last chance before he sails his best. I know that you've said the closer you get, the bigger the disaster if you fail. What do you mean by that? <laughs> it's very simple. When you are far from your goal, the disaster is small. If you're near your goal, the disaster is big if you fail. What do you think your greatest strength might be against Connor and Coke and Fay? We are even. We are even. At this moment, we are even. That's why I'm talking about the eventual big disaster for one of the three of them at the end. Mr. Gardini also told me that in 1993, if they were the defender, it would be important to defend without passports, as Europeans, not as Italians, in a truly unified community. Kayart and his Italian mates behind by 52 seconds around the button hook turn. No tacking duel on leg seven back to windward. Have they tossed in the towel? Not yet. And I would expect if American Cube continues to lead anywhere near close to a minute, which is where they are right now, you'll see Bill Coke all the way in the downwind finish as well. Wouldn't he love that? Take his boat across the finish line. Nice way to end the day after getting bonked on the noggin in the free start. Thought he was down for the count there for a second. The Red Baron. Like Snoopy, he was going down with a ship. Carry on, mates. Great overhead of America Cube. And you can see, when you compare it to Amora, how narrow that boat is on deck. One of the big design differences of the third generation America Cube design. And of course, they benefited from some extra time allowed to the defenders to deliver new boats after the challengers had to commit theirs. Yes, sir. Look at the bend in the mast. Can I destroy anything? That bend is about four feet. About twice as much as a 12 meter used to bend. Thank you. Here you can see straight head-on shots of the two America's Cup finalists. Notice how much wider Elmoro is at the deck. At the waterline level, of course, America's Cube also appears to be slightly narrower than Elmoro does at the waterline level, and that's what the water sees. But on the deck, a lot less weight, a lot less hull shape, and it certainly slips through the water pretty fast. Listen to Bill as he steers here on leg seven. Oh, on the fast side, is that okay? LPMG. What target? Thank you. 
Well, we talked about the start being just about everything in this re race, as Tommaso Chieffi alluded to earlier. If you win the start, you generally win the race with these boats in these conditions. And Paul Kayard lost the start. Yes, he did. Here was about two minutes to go before the start. Kayard on the left had the left side of the course, could have taken the pin end of the starting line. But notice he shifts to the right, letting Good American man. Cube come down to the left of him, coming in underneath. As we see a little bit further along in the starting process, America Cube moves forward to the point where they actually are on the buoy side of the course. Eventually, KR tacked away, and KR moved there to the right side. He must have thought the right end was favored. Ended up being the deciding factor in this race. Because there was more wind on the early part of the course on the left side. Mike Topa from Clearwater, the starboard trimmer there. His wife Libby was jogging over Point Loma yesterday. about Kayard losing the start. I mean, he had his brain trust. It wasn't an end He had the final decision, but the Kieffi brothers chimed in, and so did Bob Hopkins. Sure they did, and I'm sure they didn't know when they crossed the starting line that that was going to be such a bad decision. The wind has a 50-50 chance of going either direction. It just favored America Q. The airplane belongs to Rome Kirby, the young son of Jerry Kirby, the bowman. Our sailors superstitious, Peter Eisler and the men of US 55 had garlic stuffed down in the bow of Stars and Stripes in 87 and a lucky penny under the mast. Paul Kayart, he could use some racing luck. It would have lots of great race shots, revealing profiles of the competitors, the lowdown on high-tech design, and 141 years of cup history all shot by the world's top yachting photographers with over 200 full-color pages. And if you order now, you'll also receive the official video of the America's Cup, both for just $49.95, the price of the book alone. So call 1-800-282-ESPN and order now. America Cube continuing to stretch out the breeze at 12 plus knots. This boat really flying now. And also handling the chop well, too. as we are overboard with our helicopter there on ITA 25, the red protest flag that is flying on the stern of the Italian boat. That was a protest lodged by Robert Hopkins and Paul Kayart as they went around the fourth mark. The diver, Bob Sloan, was in the water there with scuba cam. And the current, I think Peter actually drifted Sloney out a little bit further than where he wanted to be. No question about that. That's right, Tim. He wanted to be on the inside of the turn. And the current pushed him from right to left until he was actually right in line of the mark and the boat. And Caird actually had to sail some extra distance to miss him. Good thing, too. I would expect at the end of the day, if the margin is close to a minute, that they will pull that red pro protest flag in. Paul Kayard, the spiritual leader of the El Moro di Venezia Syndicate, has invested close to three and a half years of his life, the Kiepi brothers, all of the crew to a man, faith in their leader. I believe they have a lot of uh, uh, faith and confidence in me. I'm a uh, you know, in a way, the advantage of being a non-Italian is precisely there. I mean, there is a reason why Mr. Gardini picked me to come and sail with Il Moro di Venezia and really start the program up. Um, I also am older than most of the guys. I've won more world championships than most of the guys. And most of the guys on this team have won the only world championship they've won in their lives with me. And that didn't happen overnight. And I didn't walk in the front door and tell them that I was the king and it was going to be that way. We did it together, and the respect that I have, I think I've earned. So when we sit down on the eve of a race and we talk about what's going to happen the next day, I have a certain credibility with them, and I think it's based on fact and history, not on uh, documentation or a piece of paper. Don't forget that this crew, this skipper, and this boat trailing the Kiwis rallied they were actually down 4-1 if you go back to the annulment, Peter. That's right. The race was thrown out. Then they were down 3-1. They won four straight. Very impressive to beat 
what many people consider to be the fastest AC boat in San Diego, the Radical New Zealand. The Kiwis have all headed home. Sir Michael Fay left last Thursday with the crew, just a skeleton office staff over on what used to be Kiwi Nato. They have now very quickly dubbed it Cuban Nato. Good to see him rejoin the United States. I thought it was like a little island of New Zealand for a while there. Another spinnaker set coming up by America Cube, and to my eyes, she's gained another 15 or 20 seconds. Tom Witten, who's aboard here, points out this is about the same distance the Stars and Stripes would have been behind in these conditions. to the top of the mast goes that spinnaker. friendly hellos as they pass by. One ten and counting on the mark rounding now as Fontini is up on the bow. Marani, part of the Italia effort back in 87 in Fremantle, the masked man. A couple of the crew, this is their very first America's Cup campaign, like Luca Dignani, however. Oh, my. 129. An ocean and a continent away. The hopes of 55 million Italians ride on this boat. Here at home, it's high noon. America Cube can clinch the grand prize. The Pacific is the venue. If past encounters are any indication, it will be anything but peaceful. At stake, yachting Holy Grail. In the long history of the America's Cup was in fact sailed in English water. The yacht America crossed the finish line 18 minutes ahead of her nearest rival. Daniel Webster proclaimed, America is first, there is no second. From schooners to tall sloops as the Civil War ran its course. And then peace and prosperity and grand yachting returned. Edison invented the camera. And like magic, moving pictures of the majestic giant boats appeared, capturing the essence of the sport. It was an era of personalities with names like Sir Thomas Lipton, who tried unsuccessfully five times. Theo M. Sopwith, an owner who steered with his wife along as timekeeper. And Harold Vanderbilt, known not for his considerable money, but for his organizational skills. The J-Boats ushered in the 30s, and like their owners, were larger than life. As Stanley Rosenfeld wrote, there were bigger sailing ships to be seen, but none with Marconi rigs, which seemed like narrow slivers of white cloth piercing the sky and taking wings. In 1956, the deed of gift was changed and the 12-meter class was born. The 70s witnessed the birth of perhaps the greatest 12-meter ever built, Courageous. At her helm, Ted Turner and a young Dennis Connor. So began the legend and a redefinition of dedication and preparation. Then the Aussie invasion of 83. Alan Bond was back with those things called wings. The wing keel, designed by the late Ben Lexon. This cup campaign forever changed the course of cup design, technology unprecedented in cup history. Dennis Connor's aggressiveness and preparedness put him up three races to one. He had a slower boat, and he had the lead. But Aussie skipper John Bertrand brought the men from down under back to square the series three all, setting up the race of the century. 
For the first time in 132 years, the cup had been wrestled away. Bond welcomed the world to the land down under and showed off Ben Lexon's wing cue. Fremantle, Western Australia, a place and a time forever etched in history. The boat stars and stripes 87 and the men who made her run. The venue gauge roads and the heavy seas of the Indian Ocean with a Fremantle doctor churning those seas to dangerous heights. Man against the elements for the supremacy of yachting. It was the Yanks against the Aussies and it was no contest. Dennis Connor, whose drive and energy and undeniable skill combined to create an almost irresistible force. Then in 88, Connor would defend in a catamaran. He called it the legalized ambush. The Kiwis came at him with the big boat, nearly twice the size of the 12 meters. When it was done, on the water and in the court, the cup stayed in San Diego, a mismatch that never should have happened. Four years later, the venue the same, but a new class of boat, longer, wider, more powerful, more maneuverable, more breakable. Dennis Connor was back too, but the master of the multiple boat campaign suffered the perils of only one boat, the new barons of the 90s, a familiar Kiwi, but a new title, Sir Michael Fay. Italy's Raul Gardini poured in tons of lira, and Bill Koch brought his art and his wine and his bank book. The trials to determine the challenger have been as ferocious as for the defender, but we've also witnessed the closest racing in America's Cup history. When the trials were done, the Italians hoisted the Louis Vuitton Cup, ironically with American Paul Kayard in charge. For the defense, it was Bill Koch who took away Dennis Conner's crown and savored the sweet taste of victory. The final two survivors. Since they've started, we've seen the closest racing in America's Cup history. We've witnessed protests disallowed. They've been battling each other for one week now. The perils of the Pacific have produced a high wire act, as well as men almost being washed overboard. The men of El Moro are poised and ready. With all their guns aimed and loaded at each other, the Italians must cross first today or it's over. this morning, Larry Myalek, Dave Dellenbaugh, Art Price, there's Buddy Melgus, the Wizard of Zenda, coming out after the workout and driving up. He's already shot some hoops, a little basketball this morning. Paul Kayard signing some autographs. And the flag over the El Moro di Venezia boat early this morning. The men with their backs up against the wall, trailing three races to one. But look how relaxed Kayard appears. Just another day out on the race course, almost like a practice day. Meanwhile, the men in white on the white boat for the defense, they can keep the San Diego Yacht Club as the home of the America's Cup because they lead this best of seven in the America's Cup, three races to one. As we welcome you back to San Diego, hi again, everybody. I'm Jim Kelly. One is fast, the other is combative. America Cubed and El Moro. One is loaded, the other is really loaded. You probably have to consult Forbes to find out exactly who has more mega millions, Bill Koch or Raul Gardini, each, if you will, the H. Ross Perot of sailing in this sailing Super Bowl. And, of course, then you have Buddy Melgus, 62 years young, the Wizard of Zenda, 62. He's going on 32. And Paul Kayard, an American in Venice, the man that is literally the heart and spirit and soul of this Italian syndicate. Bill Koch, well, he's the zany-looking character at the back of the boat, the one with the rimmed glasses, the kind of the nutty professor. He'll be chatting up a storm. Paul Kayard and Raul Gardini, quite a one-two punch there. Gardini, a very elegant in his European tie, puffing away the back of the boat. But, like the car company used to say, he prefers to leave the driving to us. So can the Italians come back? That's the question. Early this morning, our Peter Eisler on the toe out caught up in a strafing run with Paul Kayard. Paul, you're the coach and captain of the team. What do you tell them today, down 3-1? You tell them that uh, we haven't sailed a perfect race yet, and all we got to do is sail three perfect races in a row, and that's the cup's going to be ours. A lot of people are saying, where's the aggressive Paul Kayard? Does it take just aggression out there? What's the key to beating America, too? 
Well, you know, aggressivity in sailing is something that um, has to be tempered. You know, you can't being too aggressive in sailing can lead to some stupid mistakes, and uh, that you learn with 25 years of experience. And uh, so I try to be as aggressive as I can. I try to put as much heat on them as I can. I haven't been uh, as good at it as I'd like to have been so far. But then again, they haven't given the America's Cup to anybody yet. So uh, hopefully today we can start turning it around. See any new moves today at the pre-start? Always hoping to do something there that somebody hasn't seen. Like the Marx Brothers, a day at the opera, a day at the races, Kayard is ready. Now, you've been around this America's Cup game, everybody from Ted Turner to Dennis Conner. What does Kayard have to do now to join that elite group? Well, Jim, he's got to think of his normal routine. Don't think of the outcome of the race, just a tactical situation at hand. And assume that you're going out racing tomorrow. And remember, John Bertrand did win when he was down 3-1 to one in 83. And I think, Jim, that Paul Kayard is good enough to do it again. I think, though, that to be fair, that Liberty was a slow, slow boat. John Bertrand back then did have the faster boat. Now, Mr. Kayard's work definitely cut out for him. He really has to neutralize the speed of America Cube just to stay in this race. Well, the first thing he should do is simply go with his instincts. And remember, the pressure is on the other guy, too. I mean, here we have a slam dunk maneuver. Paul Kayard on the left is tacking directly on top of Buddy Melga's on the right. Melga's bears off too much, and Kayard on the left makes a perfect move, and as a result, takes the lead. This is the kind of moves he's got to do if he hopes to win today. Well, my partner here has <laughs> sent his dry cleaning out, so you're expecting another race. How about a prediction? Well, I think El Moro is really strong. I think that Paul Kayard can win today. Well, it'll be interesting to find out because it's, of course, sailing Super Bowl. It is race number five, the pre-start, just a few minutes away. As we're on board America Cube, Larry Myalik back grinding today. Now over on El Moro, you can see they came from 3-1 down to win the Louis Vuitton Cup and send the Kiwis packing back home to Auckland. ESPN's live coverage of America's Cup, day five. Brought to you by... Live pictures from the Pacific. A tremendous spectator fleet out there for race number five. It could be the clinching race in the America's Cup. Gary's already detailed. He thinks that El Moro will win today, forcing a race number six. All of the pressure squarely on the shoulders of the men from America Cube. Let's go back and take a look at exactly how we got to this 3-1 advantage. Here again is Gary. America's Cup Race Report is sponsored by AT&T. Right from the start, Paul Kayard was tough, but he ended up being too aggressive as he jumped the gun and had to restart. But around the 20-mile course, the boat seemed even in speed. America Cube went on to win by 30 seconds. After the finish, Kayard understood his mistakes and was realistic about his chances. I just look at today like, um, you know, it's hard to have a worse day than we had today from pretty much all aspects and um, we're pretty we're upbeat fortunately we've been 